now this video is in four clips. So, but this is pretty interesting. Cornell West, he gets in a lot of things in this interview. And this speaks to why we should be dim exiting. Like this interview is all dim exit right here. So let's listen. The growing Republican field for president is dominating the headlines, but other candidates are hoping the crowded field paves the way for another choice. The total number of Republican candidates right now stands at 11. Two Democrats are challenging Biden for the White House, RFK Jr. and Marianne Williamson. And then there is Cornell West. He announced last week that he is going to run on a third party ticket. Now he is switching parties. Cornell West joins me now. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, sir. You moved from the People's Party to the Green Party this week, and it makes you much more likely you're going to be on the ballot in a majority of states. Is that why you switched? Well, uh, I just want to make sure that poor and working people are at the very center of this discussion. But I want to begin by wishing you a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And indeed, indeed. But the uh, what, what the problem is we have a two-party system that doesn't highlight the precious poor and working people. I'm thinking of Brother Michael and Brother Eddie right now in Rankin County, Mississippi. Neither party speaks to his situation. We got brown brothers and sisters in the borough. We got poor whites in West Virginia, neither party, both parties tied to Wall Street, Pentagon, both parties so obsessed with the professional managerial class, they lose sight of poor people and working people. The best of America, and that's what my campaign is about, my dear sister Dana, I want to introduce America to the best of itself, the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Heschel and Dorothy Day and Edward Zaid and Grace Lee Boggs and Louisa, Louisa Marino. We've had some major voices concerned about poor and working people, not just here, but the militarism around the world and the victims of that militarism around the world. And so we're going to have a robust conversation in this presidential. Like you can see the ticks she has <laughs> when he says certain things. You can see like she has a very uh, she has a tail in her face, a tick that she knows he is saying certain things that's uncomfortable for her sponsors. She knows that. And you can see that uncomfortability. Um, but I'll let him finish off here. Let's let him finish his another 30 seconds here. Political season. Mm -hmm. You have gotten the question many times. I've heard you being asked about being a spoiler and you reject that argument, a spoiler for Joe Biden in 2024. But I want to give our viewers a little bit of history. Uh, in 2016, Jill Stein was on the ballot for the Green Party and Donald Trump ended up winning in a nail biter, particularly in some of the key states that you're looking at right now. I'm putting up on the screen just so you know the number of votes that. So this now let's go to the next video where she finishes or continues her point, And that's this video right here. Michigan and Wisconsin compared to Donald Trump's margin there. What's to say despite your, your convictions and your argument about the two parties not being the way to go, what's to say what I just showed on the screen won't happen with Cornell West on the ballot and not Till Stein? I mean, one, that, uh, you know, my dear sister Jill Stein, who got 1.07% of the vote, my dear brother Ralph Nader, who got more, he got about 4%. But you don't look to the weakest candidates as a full explanation as to why you lose. Mm -hmm. Sister Hillary Clinton lost because she was not a good candidate. She didn't go to Wisconsin, and you know even better than all of us, all the various factors that go into why she also didn't lose, not just that one factor. So the idea of putting all the responsibility on the candidates who get the fewest votes compared to the other big two it's just a way of rationalizing a two-party system that has become more and more outdated and antiquated, both tied to big money and big money. <sighs> I'm going to rewind. This is such a great answer that he gives here. Uh, and I just, like, she thought he ha she had him on a gotcha moment with this graphic, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back there. But look at this graphic, uh, Jay. Mm -hmm. Now... What doesn't tell the story, like if they had Gary Johnson's numbers here, that would give a better story. And you would see how his numbers were even larger than Jill Stein. So it kind of blows away her whole point. But you see how they try to uh, manipulate the population 
uh, here, Apollo, and they 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 are leaving out. This is what they classically do with propaganda. They omit information. Go ahead. I, it looks like you're going to chime in. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't vote in 2016 because I wasn't in the country at the time and I didn't have an absentee ballot. So, mm -hmm. but I did vote uh, in 2020. I voted for Green Party. If the Green Party, and I regret it now, I kind of voted. Sh I voted for PLS. <laughs> Howie Hawkins is a bad guy, but that's a separate issue. Yeah, um, yeah. We all but, got food. I got food too. I got food. Yeah, too. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know that implies that if you if uh, there was no third party on the ballot, that they would vote for some candidate in the duopoly, and that's just not right. true. If there was no third party, I would have just stayed the fuck home. You know, like I'm not voting for anybody in the duopoly. I'm done with that shit. Um, so it starts already under a false assumption that these votes would have gone to somebody else uh, uh, in the duopoly if uh, if the if third parties were an option, um, and all this is to like. Uh, deflect blame from them from themselves you know because i mentioned earlier that around 9.8 million two-time obama voters ended up voting for trump you know that's well, an astonishing number i didn't know that number 9.8 million uh, voted for are, tr obama twice obama yeah and then wow. uh, if you uh, just one time obama voters that go that number goes up so why the fuck is the democrat party losing all those voters why aren't you asking those questions you know like well, where's that question why is the democrat party suddenly gonna lose like all, like this many voters. What happened uh, to the Democrat Party where two-time Obama voters ended up voting for Trump? Um, you know, and, and to, to I guess CNN's credit, Van Jones did sort of explore this a little bit in 2016, 2017. Um, but that was that was just uh, one anchor and uh, one time. Uh, yeah. Oh, you mean he brought up the Larry Johnson thing? Is that what you mean? I mean Larry, I forget the guy who ran. Not, uh, Gary Johnson. I said Larry. Uh, I mean, is that what you're talking about? Or where he, no, what do you mean no. when you say Van Johnson? What 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 do he, you mean? What did he bring up? He actually, uh, I can't remember the details now, but he did a show where he spoke to many two-time Obama voters that voted for Trump. He's like, why do they do that? Oh, gotcha. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, I mean, because the narrative at the time was every Trump voter is a racist, every Trump voter is a homophobe, et cetera. And like, these were just regular working class people. They're not racist, they're not homophobic. They just don't want to vote for somebody in a duopoly. And Trump, even if he ran as a Republican, he did say a lot of anti-establishment talking points, which they were uh, right. enamored by. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is, uh, notice the difference between the liberal base and the conservative base. When Trump lost in 2020, how many of those guys ended up blaming uh, the Libertarian Party? I mean, I don't ex I don't explore the Trump base that much, but not many from what I can tell. Um, and uh, in the very beginning, when you showed that status quo clip, uh, you know, you had that uh, you had that guy saying he, he was saying some typical Fox News Republican talking. Yeah, bullshit. Yeah. But in his mind, he was being substantive. He was saying, oh, we're, uh, we're I can't even remember what he said, but it wasn't yeah. anything that was uh, shaming the other voters. Like, oh, if you only fucking not voted for Libertarian Party, Trump would be in the White House. So fuck you, Liber Par Libertarian Party voters. He didn't do that shit. Whereas, like, uh, the liberal base will uh, vilify Green Party voters, will vilify third party voters, vilify anybody that does not pretty much submit to the duopoly, you know? So it's uh, a little bit of a disconnect, in my opinion. Um, but those are two points I wanted to get at. Like, the first and foremost being that... Uh, you know, you imply that third party voters will go into duopoly if third right. parties have an option. And uh, the, they're and trying the, to say she he's she Dana uh, Bash in his in his video is obviously trying to say, well, if Jill Stein didn't run those forty nine thousand nine hundred and forty one votes would have went to Clinton and that would have pushed her over the edge to win Pennsylvania. That is. But but they know that's not true. They know that that is not true. But that's not the point. The point is not to pr say something true. The point is to make the voters think going third party will get us Trump. That's the whole point to me of this segment. They're trying yeah. to make Cornell West address that part is what I think. Yeah, uh, I think that that's yeah. I mean, they're pretty much being intentionally manipulative on purpose because uh, I mean, I. I I, I I don't know. I, I I wrestle with this back and forth. Are they do they actually believe their own bullshit or are they uh that is true intentionally yeah. spewing their own propaganda? I think it's a little bit of both sometimes, it just depends on the situation. Uh in some cases, I think I, they do believe their bullshit because uh especially well, especially the voter base for for sure in some instances do believe this. So let's let's finish out the video because he says a lot of better things. We haven't even got to some of the better things he says. Let's go back to where we were, 106, and let him continue. Both tied to big money and big military, and they don't allow us to speak 
the 60% of our fellow citizens who are wrestling every day trying to put money on the table and waiting for the next check and the gross wealth inequality continues and, and, and the military budget continues to expand. We saw this with Brother Biden. But I do want to say this, though, just quickly, that this, 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 this campaign is also about getting beyond hatred and revenge. You see, I don't hate Brother Trump. I hate his lies and his gangster neo-fascism. I don't hate Brother Biden. I hate his hypocrisy and I hate his milk toast neoliberal policy. And we have to be able to engage in a public conversation that gets beyond eye for an eye and, and this vicious kind of revenge so that it reinforces the distrust and the paranoia. And that's a immeasurable dimension. That's the invisible dimension of my campaign that's going to set a different kind of tone of what my brother Cliff West calls a paradigm shift in American politics. Because I'm a jazz man in the world of politics, and the jazz man is always about improvisation, always about compassion, always about style, and always about a smile. That's that's not the end. It feels like that was the end of the clip, but they um uh, or end of the interview because he ended on a high note there, but. There's actually more he says, and I'm loving how he is absolutely, uh, I guess, dismantling the blue red game. All right. So let's let him. So she tries to get him a second time. She couldn't get him on the Jill Stein graphic. He had a great answer. Like, you know, basically, you know, Hillary Clinton was a flawed candidate. Don't try to act like this small amount of people is what swung why they didn't, you know, she didn't win. It was a lot of other factors. So she tries to get him on something he said in 2020 or did in 2020 and watch. He has another uh, great answer to that. You made the arguments during the 2020 campaign, similar to what I'm hearing you make now when you were uh, uh, backing other candidates, Bernie Sanders, to be precise. But you did end up voting for Joe Biden because you said four more years of Donald Trump could be worse. Why isn't that the case for you this time around? What I learned from my very dear brother, Bernie Sanders, you know, I have a very profound uh, respect for him, even as we disagree on a number of things. But I'm thoroughly convinced he was treated unjustly. I'm thoroughly convinced that the corporate wing of the Democratic Party will always use the progressive wing as a kind of window dressing. The progressive wing will never mm -hmm. triumph. We almost triumphed. And then the neoliberals came together after the call by Obama to Amy and, 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 and Pete and the others. And therefore, I'm thoroughly convinced that first, Pushing back Trump, that's exactly what I tried to do, part of an anti-fascist coalition. But then I began to see, you never, ever defeat mm. fascism with a milk toast neoliberalism that doesn't have vision and passion. The only way you defeat fascism that is coming to America if we do not fight is a strong vision, strong passion. And then I'm going, as I've said, to Trump country itself. Yeah. I'm going to my white brothers and sisters and say, don't scapegoat the most vulnerable, confront the most powerful. There's another way of looking at that. Well, I want to That's ask you about that. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for inter interrupting, but I, I was going to ask you about mm -hmm. that because you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, to my colleague Jake Tapper that you're going to go to Trump country. What specifically do you think that people who are ardent Trump supporters... So she couldn't get him on that second point. So she picks up, she hears something. Oh, he says, Trump, let me pull in this blue culture war. So tell us, what are you going to go say to these Trump supporters? And he has another great answer. But before I get to his answer, I couldn't tell. I wasn't on, watching the screen. Did one of you wanted to chime in? I couldn't tell. I thought I heard something. Let's finish out the clip and what he says. He's just destroying the, the duopoly. He's destroying the Democratic Party, too. And he's his critique doesn't even go as far as mine. Joe Biden is is a fascist. He's a fascist. He's the one that's censoring people. He's the one that's marching us to war with two nuclear powers. Like he's the one that's doing all this. He's the one that's still going after Julian Assange. So, uh, you know, he and he's the one that's locking up, trying to lock up his jail, his political opponents. So the fascism is coming from the elements um, of the Democratic Party like a, a, a Jammu Barak says, and let's finish out this, uh, these last two clips. I'm going to my white brothers and sisters and say, don't scapegoat the most vulnerable, confront the most powerful. There's another way of looking at that. Well, I want to That's ask you about that. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for inter interrupting, but I, I was going to ask you about mm -hmm. that because you mentioned mm -hmm. 
uh, to my colleague Jake Tapper that you're going to go to Trump country. What specifically do you think that people who are ardent Trump supporters are going to be receptive to in your message? Well, one, I don't believe that they're homogeneous and monolithic. About one out of ten, ten for them, a ten of them voted for Brother Bernie himself. They were look. So I thought he was going to say, because it's to your point, uh, Jay, you mentioned this. Um, you don't have to chime in here, but you mentioned how one you said uh, nine million or close to 10 million Obama, double Obama voters voted for Trump. And he's and uh, Cornell West is bringing up the same point. Like these aren't monoliths like because she's trying to present what you what are you going to do to go talk to these? Trade? Well, they're they're not all the same. And he's making the point. Some of those voters were actually uh, former Bernie Sanders uh, supporters. So. Let's let uh, let him finish and then we'll comment, make our last comments. Looking for an alternative because they see through the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party talking about justice on the one hand, but tied to big money on the other. And so I want to go back to those folk and recognize when I see a Trump supporter, I don't see a stereotype. I see a human being, many of them who are wounded and and too many of them follow a neo-fascist policy. He is saying too many good things. They they thought they literally thought they were gonna bring him back on for him to to fumble, and he is just not fumbling. A piper rather than an alternative, and that's where the legacy of Martin King and Heschel and Dorsey day. How do you bring poor and working people together across race, across gender, in such a way that they all begin to provide? a serious challenge to the powers that be. It's like a jazz band, my dear sister, like Bill Evans on the piano with Miles Davis' quintet. He's a white brother. He ain't a white ally. He's in the band. Well, this campaign is about the band. And the band is going to bring all these different kind of folk together. And we're not singing the same song, no. We're not playing the same note, no. But we are raising our voices in such a way that we're keeping the focus on something bigger than us. For Martin King, it was a beloved community. And for us, it is deep democracy. It is empowering poor and working people, not just here, but around the war and the world in terms of U.S. foreign policy and pulling back on the militarism around the world. Well, I, I hope to be Penny Lane and uh, one of your trips and go out with the band and see and see how how uh, how you play out there, particularly. You see the smiles, you see the uncomfortableness, and I'm going to let both of you chime in. They are definitely afraid of Cornell West.